Ho, ho, ho. Happy Holidays Tour Breakaway Edition. We're back with a little, little holiday treat. We're getting one in here, but we ease into the Christmas week, a late Sunday night, and probably more likely a Monday morning pod to listen to on this week leading into Christmas. So odds and ends, people trying to wrap up for the year. Good luck with it. And here's a little, little break from that uh, work that you're doing, but trying to get away from. So here it is. Lots of good stuff going on in the cycling world the last two weeks. Of course, none of it on the bike, unless you're watching cyclocross, in which we've had kind of a less than exciting year compared to 2020 when we had Matthew Vanderpoel, Pidcock, and Wout Van Aert going head to head a little bit more frequently. We'll see them all go head to head on Boxing Day on December 26th. So that'll be fun. But uh, for those watching, we had uh, Pidcock uh, second today in uh, Nemur and uh, winning yesterday. So it's all happening. Uh, but we had a lot of exciting stuff going on off the bike the last couple of weeks. Uh, the transfers of Dylan Gronewagen. And then just a little bit more news and interesting interviews, uh, I thought, coming out of Team UAE, which I will now dub as Team UAI more than Team you and me, some potential drama that I see coming. And I would have get, put a pod in, but I was out busy racing myself. I wasn't on two wheels, but I was out on the roads out in Sacramento, put on a pretty, pretty popular marathon called California International Marathon out there trying to stamp my bid for the Boston Marathon and go under three hours, which I was able to do. And uh, actually just got out for my first run since. So good to know the legs still got it. And uh, it was good fun. So look, looking forward to spinning the wheels again, though, because it's been a little bit of time and mostly just been running. So looking forward to some some winter miles on the trainer. But really two two big topics to cover. So first, want to talk Jumbo Visma, the heels of this Dylan Gronewagen departure from Jumbo Visma, his move to bike exchange, break down the meaning of that for both teams, given the growing chance of Wout for green. Uh, and then the conflicting chances for Matthews and Gronewagen at Bike Exchange. So that's going to be part one. And then part two, I want to take a, t- a look at Team UAE. And they've basically been rounding out a two-year journey to bolster up support for Tade Pogaccia. But have they created a movie star situation for themselves that will end up doing more harm than good? Maybe. And I uh, I had a, read a fascinating article, uh, interview from David Formolo. Um, Want to go through that. And uh, also just some, you know, what we've heard from Almeida and Mark Hershey so far and um, shed some light on what we might be seeing for Team UAE in the year ahead. So when the news broke that Dylan Gronewagen was leaving Yumbo Visma, I, look, s- surprising a, a little bit, but. At the same time, you got to just say, okay, yeah, definitely a good move. I mean, this team is built around GC aspirations. And then outside of that, yeah, look, you got Wout Van Aert. And at the end of the day, he's also got the same number of sprint wins as Dylan Gronewagen on the Champs-Élysées. Not that he's aspiring to be a, str- a, a straight sprinter alone, but may want to win the sprint jersey, take home that green. And the fans would definitely want to back him on that, of course. And – while the team did a lot to support Grona Vegan with his time away from the sport, the comeback from the Jakobsen incident, it does kind of feel like a change that could be a good thing for everyone involved. And uh, of course, if you're Dylan Grona Vegan, you're a sprinter. Yeah, you want to be at the Tour de France. It's all about stage wins at a place like the Tour de France. And that is just not in the cards for him in 2022 with Yumbo Visma. Like there was no way that he was going to be on the Tour de France roster. So, Let's look at the Yumbo Visma side first, and this will start with Gronovagen, but then kind of deviate into all knock-on effects of that. Um, let's look at look what we heard from Wild Van Aert, because he was in the end of November saying, next year I really want to go for the green jersey. This is a direct quote. Uh, then that's what will happen, and we will make plans that fit the general team tactics. Even then, it does not mean I am by definition a loose pawn and that the six others can concentrate on road, Roglic, My point is that if I go for green, I expect the team to support me in that. And it would be a bit strange to say, primos, I won't help you. Uh, I am a rider who can take rides and points without the teammates being bothered by it. We will definitely look into that next year and we'll see who can help me with that. So 
while basically saying, I want to go for green. The team should make that happen. I will still work for Roglic, but at the same time, I'll need some help with that. Now we can point to some folks who could look, I think you look at um, the the intake of Atish Benut in particular. Uh, some of that punch could definitely help Wow in those areas where he's going to look to separate himself uh, from the pack, you know, not necessarily on a mountain stage to go away and get some points. So definitely, uh, definitely a rider to look to see if they're going to put him on the Tour de France roster. But now in response to that, you can't say WVA without saying MVDP and the Rudhoofed brothers, they're the managers of Alpes and Phoenix. They responded and they said, we'll see about that. And in response to Wout saying that he's going to go for, for green. So definitely interesting of them to say that Vanderpool has now weighed in on the issue, which is also interesting. Uh, but uh, the Rudhoff brothers, they both, uh, they pointed to both Jasper Philipson and MVDP as options. Um, so uh, I think that's, that's interesting. Okay. Um, we'll come back to that. And then let's look at the other side of the coin, which is uh, the Primo's Roglic side. And so when he's asked about the situation, he says, a good question. In theory, anything is possible. We can get green and yellow and also polka dot jersey with Seb Kuss, but the team has to determine what our main goal is. And we have to have a plan that works for the two of us. And he went on to say, it must be the intention that Wout and I help each other. We have to find ways so he can go for the stage win and I can try and get some time at the same time. We have to think about that carefully. And then he also went on to say, like, look, he's not obsessed with winning the Tour de France. Does he want it? Yes. But he just wants to also be known as a guy who fought really hard. And, you know, if he gets Tour de France along the way, great. But he doesn't want his career to be defined by having won it or not won it, which is cool. So there seems to be common ground that both believe that they can achieve their goals, that the goals need not be um, – dependent on each other, but could be um, both attainable with the right plan in place. And the question is, you know, could that actually work? You know, could that, could that happen? It is against all common principles to go for two, two jerseys in the Tour de France. Uh, You don't set up your teams that way. If you do, you're not setting yourselves up for success. It's just not what you do. And, um, I mean, you look back to, I mean, 2020 Tour de France, when they only had a singular goal, people were saying, hey, you got to, you know, you, you you can't even keep multiple options for yellow. You got to just go in all on one guy. You can't, you can't sacrifice any seconds even. So it really goes against cycling principles, but Wout Van Aert is not your standard fair guy. And so we'll talk about it. So can it work? Now, first, when we think about this, you know, can you go for yellow and green? I just want to talk about green for a second. Um, because when I think about, well, who could win the green jersey? And I want to come back to this because this is going to be an open debate because it's a very multidimensional uh, bid for the green jersey in 2022. I'm just going to say Matthew Vanderpool should not go for green. Alpes and Phoenix strategy for 2022 Tour de France should not be to send Matthew Vanderpool for green. I don't think it's the best strategy. And you might be saying, why? Why, Rob? How could you say no MVDP? For anything. He's a beast. Why would you say this? Why would you say MVDP? No green. And what I say to that is, look at what Alpeson did in the 2021 Grand Tours. Tim Merlier won the first sprint stage of the Giro. MVDP won stage two of the Tour. Merlier the next day won stage three. Philipson wins two stages at the Vuelta. Five Grand Tour wins in their first year at the Dances. And also... Philipson had six top three stage finishes in the Tour de France behind Merlier and Vanderpool each winning a stage. That is massive. And they were always there and thereabouts. And when you look at the fact that Philipson had six top threes without sneaking in a win, these guys could have walked away with six, seven, eight wins at Grand Tours last year. Now, you could also say, well, you know, Caleb Ewan didn't crash, then... You know, they probably would have had none and this, that, the other thing. But if you if you go for this MVDP approach, you have you thwart all your chances to win stages with Merlier and MVP MVDP, excuse me, with Merlier and Phillips and to give MVD 
pee a shot at green. You have to go because you have to go all in with very limited exceptions because you need Vanderpool to take as many points in every bunch sprint to have a shot at winning green. And, you know, could he win a bunch sprint also and, and take bunch sprint win? Yeah. Yeah. You know, he, he could be there and thereabouts. Look, he's done it before on hard stages, like the UAE tour last year. Um, one heads up, didn't even need a lead out. Like he is that strong that he could possibly win some, but, you're gonna you're gonna sacrifice um, a lot of a lot of viable win opportunities to have a shot at Vanderpool taking green because even if they go in all in on Vanderpool, not guaranteed that he's gonna get it. So I'd say race it like you did this year. Let Vanderpool go crazy wherever he wants to go crazy. He could probably win a handful of stages, um, and then alongside that, do what you did last year whatever, pick Phillipson, pick Merlier on their day, go out, execute, and take a couple more stage wins. Team could take three, four, five stage wins. That is an incredible result for a team like Albus and Phoenix. So I don't think it's in their best interest to sacrifice such great upside for a shot at green. So that's my thought. Now, they also did say, hey, we might go bet on Phillipson for green. Um that would have to come without the expense of Vanderpool working for him at one, because Vanderpool is a horrible lead out guy. He's too strong. He'll just get and take his pull and pull away from everybody. So he's just a horrible lead out guy. So if they're going to do that, you're basically just sacrificing more You're saying he's our Morku. He's going to be our lead out guy for Phillips. And he gets no chances and we'll see how deep Phillips can go in this whole thing. Um, but that can't come at the expense of a Vanderpool not having his chances at other stages. So either way, the rub for wow, if he if Wow goes for green, is that Vanderpool is the is the one rider that can really neutralize some of his strengths. You know, the hilly stages where he might get away, getting into some of the breaks. He he's gonna basically block points from Wow. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, but going back to the whole like, could this work for Yumbo Visma, this green yellow strategy? Does it work? Yes, it absolutely works. And not only does it work, but I like it. I like it better than Wout not going for green. And here's why. So first, Wout could, first of all, be wearing green in week one. If not wearing yellow, you've got an opening stage time trial. And then on stage five, you're in Lille doing cobblestones, really hard stage and a stage Wout can win. He could win two of the first five stages, not even counting if he goes for a bunch sprint. So say he's tops in the time trial gets away and goes for a stage win, and whether he wins it or not, is in a position to probably pull on the yellow jersey in the first week. Let him go ride. Let him move ahead and race the mountain stages. Because look what happened. 2020, who pulled the Peloton? Yumbo Visma. They pulled for Ineos. They pulled for UAE. They controlled the entire race. How did that work out for them? Not good. So we've got six mountain stages, stages 7, 9, 11, 12, 17, and 18. Now, if Wout is going for green, and he's very well positioned in, in the lead of the green jersey competition, and maybe even yellow at the end of the first five days, why not send him up the road for the intermediate sprints to get points and see what happens from there? Maybe he can get away. Remember, this is the man who won the double ascension of Mont Ventoux in 2021 of the Tour de France. If he's out front, Jumbo Visma does not need to chase with the man on the road. These are the rules of cycling. They do not need to chase. And the situation is like very plausible. Like, is it a high likelihood that Watson in yellow and green after at the, end, at the end of the first five days? No, you can't bet on that because, you know, anything could always happen in there, but there's a good shot. And given the structure of the race and Wout's unique strength, I I love this. I love this look for Jumbo Visma. And so they don't need to do the pacing when Wout's up the road. And then when they do, this team is so stacked. Rohan Dennis coming over from Ineos. Tom Dumoulin, resurgent. He's back. Don't forget he got a medal in the Olympics after coming back last year. Robert Gessink, Kreutzvik, Tish Benut 
added to the artillery. Vingegaard and Sepp Kuss, let's go. Yellow green machine. Let's see it. I'd love to see it. Now, again, overall, green should be a great competition this year. You've got Sam, and there's a lot of storylines. You've got Sam Bennett going to Bora Hansgrohe. He's going to be competing against his old team, Decoyne Quickstep, after all the drama with uh, Patrick Lefevre. And on that end, you kind of want to be rooting against Decoyne Quickstep, but they're probably going to be positioning Fabio Jakobsen, if not um, the Manx man, Mark Cavendish. So either of those guys are going to be getting cheered for hugely uh, for Decoyne and Quickstep. And then you've got this multidimensional aspect with Wout Van Aert and Matthew Vanderpool, who could be going for it. And then, of course, a couple other guys that are just going to be going to be mixing it up. So I'm going to throw a poll on this at some point because I want to know who you think is going to win. Um, it's going to be a really interesting competition in 2022. Now, back to Gronewegen. Overall, good move for him to leave. Uh, but this move sends him to Bike Exchange, who've got a very popular lead man to date and who also thinks he competes for green uh, in Michael Matthews. And... This guy, Michael Matthews, has seen way better years. Zero wins in 2021. He did somehow finish second in the green jersey standings, but was in 2021 in the Tour de France, but he was way far back. He only had two top three stage finishes. So I'm like, how did you beat uh, Philipson, who had six top threes? But that's it's how it worked out. Um, and this is also a season where he's coming up just one World Tour win in 2020, and that was at the Brittany Classic, which, yeah, okay, it's a World Tour race, but... Um, it's the Brittany Classic. The reality is Bike Exchange is clearly showing that they're of the mind that Michael Matthews is not a good bet for them for a big time sprinter for the year. And they said like they kind of viewed what they brought Gronovagan in for as an open as an open opportunity on the team. So you'll have like Michael Matthews will have some certainly have chances like there's enough mouths. You know, there's, <laughs> there's not too many mouths to feed in this category for Bike Exchange. So he's going to have plenty of chances. But Gronewegen is going to be the heavyweight sprinter for bike exchange at the Tour de France and likely going to win a stage, uh, if not move. So good move for Jumbo Visma, good move for bike exchange. And at the end of the day, Michael Matthews is the collateral damage of this move. So um, part one, that's done. All right. That's the Jumbo Visma, Gronewegen, green, yellow situation. And now I want to talk a little bit about UAE. This isn't getting like a lot of news all up, but I think team UAE, you and me, me and I is actually going to be a little bit dramatic in 2022. And this is the team that look, it's like, Hey, we're, we're bolstering up because we've got a 23 year old back to back Tour de France champion Watt freak with Tade Pogacar. And the thing is, the signings that they've brought in have been kind of interesting. Um, now, for I mean, for context, Pog is the guy, right? So wherever he's racing, he's going to be the lead man. And so what he said for the year is he's going to do uh, four monuments and two grand tours. He's going to do Flanders, Milan San Remo, Liege, Bastogne, Liege, Tour de France, and the Vuelta, and then Lombardia. I think Lombardia will come just after the Vuelta, uh, if not before. But either way, so that's his agenda. So when Pog's on the road, he's the undisputed leader for those races. And let's look at now who's joined the roster for 2022. Well, actually, let's also, before we do that, not forget, Mark Hershey joined last season and just had a forgettable season, but he says he's he's ready for good stuff in 2022. Back to his 2020 form, let's hope so. And Rafal Micah. Now, Rafal Micah, he's kind of getting to the latter days. He's quietly and happily going to be a, dom- a strong domestique for Tade Pogaccia. So that's a little bit of the more recent context. Now, for 2022, they add a couple guys. George Bennett from Diombo Visma, Mark Soler from Movistar, and Yao, Yao Almeida, who... I think is a top two prospect alongside Alexander Vlasov. So this is a big signing coming over from quick step with all the Remco Venipol drama. So, Oh, and by the way, they also add some sprint capability with Pascal Ackerman, Alvaro Hodge joining uh, Fernando Gaviria, who's been on a really big cold slump after being, I think the 
probably the first human to get COVID twice um, in 2020 and having a disastrous season. And then a really, a really tough 2021 um, where he just did not get things right. So um, that's going to be a really busy sprint situation, but I'm not going to go into that too much. It's going to focus on the GC stuff um, and more of the, the grand tour stuff. So the way I see it, Pog's got the undisputed leadership when he's racing. So that has to be the agreement for everyone. But for folks like Mark Hershey, David A. Formolo, Mark Soler, and Jao Almeida, who have aspirations themselves, I got to call out a couple quotes just to kind of show like where people are thinking. Um, because particularly David Formolo said some interesting stuff. He said, normally I shouldn't do the tour next year. I'll be concentrating on the Giro. The plan is to only do the Giro. So I'll be more focused. After the crash this year, I was already thinking about the tour by the last week. Next year, I wanted to be 100% focused on the Giro. For the big classics, I certainly feel ready enough to say I'm capable of winning them. For the Grand Tours, uh, some more waters probably need to pass under the bridge. He went on to say, I'll play my own cards more next year. So we wanted to try this. I'll do a bit less with Tade and more for myself. So we'll have different preparation. Uh, also notable, he's switching coaches. He was using the same coach as Pogaccia and is switching coaches, which apparently is not something new to him. So you've got, you've got Formula saying, hey, look, like I worked for Tade last year, but this year I'm going to go do my own thing. And I'm going to focus primarily on the Giro and then some of the big classics. Now by classics, does that mean some of the monuments as well? Like what, like what exactly does that mean? Where's their overlap going to be? Because um, uh, it's going to be tough to argue that formula is going to be a better uh, fit for really any race over Pogaccia. I, I mean, I just, I, I can't, I can't see one that he's a better fit for. So that's one. Now, second, Mark Soler. We've all seen the documentaries. Mark Soler is very vocal. Um, he can get frustrated easily. It's also a bit inconsistent. And right now he's just slated for the Vuelta, which makes sense. This is from Spain. Um, I'm really interested to see how this signing goes because um, – it's unclear where he's going to get a big leadership position that he really wants outside of a one week stage race. Like maybe he's thrown back to like a tour of Romandy or something like that. Or, I mean, maybe he can get one of the two, um, like, uh, Torino Adriatico or like a Perry Nice get into like one of those that Tade is not. But it's it's unclear. So um, it's unclear that he's going to get leadership opportunities, except for what where he would want one, which is really at the Vuelta. But at this stage, he's going to be in the Vuelta with Tade Pogaccia, who's going to be the undisputed leader. So it's going to be interesting to see if they can satisfy Soler and if he's going to be a happy rider, happy to the extent that he's then going to gladly work for Pog when they are in the same Grand Tour. Time will tell. Now, the next one is um, Mark Hershey. Mark Hershey, who came off a very quiet 2021, lots of injuries, some injuries coming off his last season with Sunweb in 2020, where he was really the darling of the season. A um, couple top three finishes, stage win, most combative prize at the 2020 Tour de France. Um, just a tough season after the transfer, like a hip or groin injury, but he says he's back and he's ready for his, his 2022 se season to look like 2020. Cool. Um, there's definitely going to be some classics that he can do. Um, he's definitely going to be hunting for stages. I think by and large, he will be content with his role, but if he is part of the Tour de France squad, he's going to be also be like on full duty. The thing is this team is just not deep enough that they can have these guys go out and do what they want to do without having to dedicate a lot of time um, as a, as a domestique in some capacity. And in a lot of cases you say, well, that's not like a big deal. Like a lot of, a lot of people love doing that. Um, Yes, but those people love doing that. Uh, when we talk about a Mark Soler, when we talk about a Formula, when we look at like a Mark Hershey, these are folks who um, went different places, and in this case UAE, in large part because they were looking for more opportunities. 
Now, the last one, which is most interesting, is their biggest signing, which is Jao Almeida. And uh, he had a really awkward exit from the Dequina Quick Step team. We remember in the Giro last year, very strange situation where, where Remco, he, he had a horrible early stage. And I, I never really got to the bottom of like what went wrong, why he lost so much time on the, one of the first opening days of the race. And he was uh, then uh, relegated to be in support of Remco Venepol. Um There was a, the stage, I forget if it was the Montalcino stage, or maybe it was even um, two days earlier, where um, Remco fell into difficulty. Almeida was far up the road. Remco, um, for lack of a better term, lost his shit on the radio in great frustration that that Almeida wasn't there. Almeida falls back to help him uh, get back on terms. They both lost a lot of time. And over the coming days, Remco's legs completely fell out from under him. And uh, Almeida was climbing his way back uh, in the overall GC standings thereafter and nearly uh, climbed his way all the way back onto the podium. And so a really awkward exit from there. Almeida is saying, hey, I'm going to race the Giro and the Vuelta um, in 2022. And he's actually got backing. This is the one area where the UAE team is backing the statements of one of these riders. Not that they're actively not backing the statements of the other riders, but where they've said, hey, Ameda is not here to work for anybody. I thought that was a very um, interesting and bold and enlightening statement from them. Uh, he's he's here um, to you know be successful, and uh, that they're backing him on that. So that's that's great to hear, and that might be true, but only true in part um, because so if he is going to be a leader, he can go and do that at the Giro. But he has now had his teammate David Formolo, who is probably their next strongest rider. Um, in that in that event who said i'm writing for myself and i'm going all in for myself on the giro so cool that team management has said hey you know this is almeida is going to be our leader you've had you've got formulo here saying um i'm writing for myself and my own aspirations so that's a bit of a conflict and then um when you look ahead his second race this season is going to come back and ride the vuelta well in the vuelta you've got tade pogaccia and also mark soler so how's that going to go? Um, presumably, uh, if Pog is going to do the Vuelta, he's there to win. And, you know, there was speculation after each of the last two years, hey, Pog won the Tour de France. Does he go on and, and try to win the, win the Vuelta um, and move on to build his Palmares across the Grand Tours? And it looks like this is the year he's finally going to do it. Um, he's going there to win. So I don't see a instance here where, you know, barring catastrophe, um, Zhao really has two very clean, clear cut opportunities to be a leader at a grand tour. Um, despite what management says, because of the way that the riders have presented themselves, both, both literally stating and then, um, separately just through kind of prior actions that we've seen from Solaire in the past. So, um, UAE is getting to the point where they've got a they've uh, not a spoil of riches and that they've really bolstered their uh, their lineup, but the signings give me pause in terms of their cohesiveness to be successful as a team. Um, this doesn't smell of roses like we have on a Yumbo Visma squad where folks have um, accepted and are excited to play the roles that they have on the team. Um, it's one where I think there's a lot of open question marks. That may end great, um, but I suspect this is not going to be a cozy ending uh, for everybody. I wouldn't be surprised if some of the riders we talked about when we exit 2022 go and find um, new teams or don't end in a pretty way. So we'll see. But I just want to call that out because I, <clears throat> I haven't heard a lot of people talking about it, that this, this has you know, potential for some, some issues, and I just simply think it does. So I'd like to know what you think. If UAE is going to be uh, UAE me and everyone's uh, battling for themselves or if they're going to be a great team. So let me know. Either way, um, thanks for listening. It's the end of the year. Also, hey, holiday gift for me, if you don't mind. If you are not subscribed to the pod and you've listened this far, subscribe, 
leave a rating. I actually haven't had a written rating on the podcast players for a while. So if you're a podcast player listener, leave the rating, leave a review. That's epic. And then if you're on the the um, the YouTube, which is definitely the area I'm trying to grow the most, um, give a subscribe, share it with a friend. Would love that. And then of course, uh, like a video, comment on it, and let's get the dialogue going on there. Um, that would mean a lot. So um, appreciate it. Uh, if I don't get another pot out, happy 2022 to everybody. Hopefully I get one out, but you never know. But Merry Christmas to all. And um, till next time, thanks for listening to the Door Breakaway.